Afternoon. Welcome to the City Club. I'm Mary Kramer, President. Our first order of business is to welcome our new members. I'll call their names and ask them to rise. And if you would hold your applause until all have been introduced, then we'll give them a rousing welcome. First of all is Gary DeSalvo, Assistant Vice President and Branch Manager of Oregon Title Insurance Company. Next is Jay Lyman, Transportation Project Manager, David Evans and Associates. Robert Newman, Associate, excuse me, Associate Solid Waste Planners, Metro, and Janet Westwood. We're glad to have you. Our thanks go to club members who recruited these new members, Jim Ivancy, Isaac Regenstrife, Charlie Schiffman, and Mark Turrell. Thank you very much. Next Friday, August 3rd, our speaker will be Dr. Michael Mooney, president of Lewis and Clark College. He's going to speak on higher education in Portland, the independent college perspective. After all the hubbub about our state universities and PSU specifically, and the formation of the Governor's Commission on Higher Education, it seemed only right that we hear from this other group. Dr. Mooney will give us their ideas. They will be talking to the Governor's Commission soon. We'll be back here at the Benson Hotel in the Mayfair Room. The following Friday, August 10th, our speaker will be Carl Abbott, Professor of Urban Studies and Planning at Portland State University. He's going to speak on prolonging the Portland Revolution. We'll be here in the Mayfair Room again. Today's program is the first Friday program to be underwritten by City Club's Science Breakfast Fund. It's used by the club's Science and High Tech Standing Committee to host the popular series of science breakfasts. On behalf of the Board of Governors, I want to extend a warm thank you to the sponsors of this fund who have made this program and our Science Breakfast series possible. Those who made it possible are CH2 M. Hill, Good Samaritan Hospital, Kaiser Foundation, Health Plan of the Northwest, Mitter Graphics Foundation, Precision Cast Parts Corporation, Intel Corporation, Fujitsu America Incorporated, and Tektronics Foundation. Today we're lucky enough to have two people in the audience from that group. We have Kurt Bagnell of CH2M Hill and Bob French of Intel Corporation. Let's give them a real thank you. <clears throat> we have another person and organization to thank today. That's David Kwame, media producer at Pacific Power. We'd like to thank both he and his firm for their special assistance and equipment that we have needed for today's program. We will be using a few slides. Uh, Dr. Bryson says they will not uh, confuse the radio audience, uh, but they will be used uh, as he speaks. I do need to remind you that next week the no smoking policy takes effect. The board voted to eliminate smoking at Friday programs in June. Our board host today, seated at my far right, is James Harris, member of the Board of Governors and Assistant Vice President at First Interstate Bank. He has the privilege of the first question. The second question today will be asked by Dana Peck, who is chair of the Science and High Tech Standing Committee. He's a manager, strategic planning for Pacific Power and Light. After our speaker's remarks, we will open the program to questions from City Club members. Preference is always given to those people who move to the mic, but we will ask written questions as time permits. There are farms on your table. Fill them out, hold them up, and staff will collect them and bring them up. A gentle reminder, whether you ask a written or an oral question, remember to be clear, concise, and ask a question. Now it's time for our program today. 
On August 31, 1988, presidential nominee George Bush extended a campaign promise. Quote, those who think we are powerless to do anything about the greenhouse effect are forgetting about the White House effect. As president, I intend to do something about it. In an editorial entitled White House Gases on July 11, 1990, New York Times editors asked, do what? It seems President Bush refused to participate in an international timetable to limit emissions of carbon dioxide, which many fear is leading to a catastrophic warming of our climate. The editors call on President Bush to offer an alternative, perhaps an open forum discussion on sensible ideas. Every industrial nation represented at the economic summit pledged to stabilize greenhouse gases, except for the U.S. Simple, sensible precautions seem reasonable. We're told that computer models that predict global warming are full of uncertainties. Our speaker today, a critic of global warming theories, will give us the background to understand this controversy. He's Dr. Reed A. Bryson, senior scientist at the Center for Climactic Research, Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Wisconsin. He received his Bachelor's of Science in Geology from Denison University and his PhD in Meteorology from the University of Chicago. He was a participant in the discovery of the jet stream during World War II, and he taught at the University of Wisconsin from 1946 to 1986 when he founded the Institute of Environmental Studies. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Bryson. Odd weather we've been having. <laughs> I think it's stupid of the weather to put white snow on purple heather, to dry the crops at summer's height and freeze the corn on autumn night. I think it awful of the monsoon to fail at all, likewise the typhoon, to push the desert south in Mali and flood upon the Isle of Bali but I must make it most emphatic that the climate is not static, that the change is here to stay until it goes the other way. <laughs> the climate changes all the time. So when people raise the question, what are we gonna do about the climate changing? We must look to the past. If we can't understand the past, we sure can't understand the future. Climate has always changed as long as we know and will always continue to change. Can we understand why? Because if we don't, then we can't predict. Over the last two million years, there has been a succession of ice ages. They come and go about every 100,000 years and in that two million year period that we know about these things, periods like the present between major glaciations occupy about 6% of the time. So we're living in a most unusual kind of climate considering the past million or two million years. Can we explain why that has happened? we can explain it with great precision. The timing of the ice ages is given with great precision by simply looking at the geometry of the Earth-Sun system. When we are closest to the sun, summer or winter, the precession of the equinoxes, in other words, how far we are from the sun as the orbit of the sun changes, these are all calculable. We know what they have been. We know what they are going to be. And we can calculate accurately and simply when the glaciation has come on the basis of that. And so we might as well settle right now. Will there be another ice age? Yep. There will be. When? 
Well, it will peak about 10,000 A.D. None of us will be here to see the ice creeping down across Puget Sound or into the Midwest. In the first place, it isn't going to be that big a glaciation. It'll only get down to about where the ice was 8,000 years ago, somewhere down in central Canada. But there will be another glaciation. And sea level will go down, not up, and flood everything as more ice is tied up on the continents. We know what does that, but it changes on the scale of 10,000 years to 440,000 years. Now, if we look at the last, this present interglacial, the last 10, 13,000 years or so, to see what has happened in the climate, we see that superimposed upon a sort of long, slow variation that's due to this Sun-Earth geometry, there is a series of fluctuations on different scales on the order of a century, two centuries, 2,000 years. We know from studying the past that there have been droughts that lasted 700 years within the last 10,000 years. We know that there was a rapid warming up of the Earth 10,800 years ago at the end of the last ice age. It was very fast. We know by looking at the past that when the climate changes, it changes abruptly on the scale of, of this 10,000 year period. The climatic changes within that have been very abrupt, very fast. These have produced big social impacts. There was a cold period in Northern Europe that coincided with the onset of the wandering of the Northern European tribes down into Southern Europe and into the Mediterranean. I call it the Vandal event because the Vandals were moving south. And we can actually model why that has happened we can make a computer model that gives you the ups and downs and that fits what we know from measurements. And we can match up a lot of these events that we calculate and that we know happen in terms of other things like changes in ve vegetation and changes in rivers and so on. We can match that up with social events and see that there have been times when the cultures of the world have been dramatically impacted by rapid changes of climate. We know it has happened in the past, rapidly. What caused it? Well, the easiest way to model it is assume that the, you can calculate the solar radiation. That's a simple astronomical calculation. You do it on a PC, by the way. In fact, you can do most anything on a PC. The models that I'm talking about were all run on a PC. And if you add to that volcanic activity, because when you add that volcanic activity, then you can drive the model to show when these events should have occurred. From observed volcanic activity, you can calculate what should have happened to the climate. When you get that, you find that it matches up with dramatic historic events. Volcanism, as you know, changes from time to time, and it puts stuff into the air, and that stuff that goes into the air is very critical to the transparency of the atmosphere. Well, you've got one across the river over here that uh, every so often makes the air less transparent. But that's not the important part. The important part is the sulfur that volcanoes put into the air. And the number of volcanoes globally changes from time to time, and there's more eruptions than you think. There have been over 1,700 so far in this century alone. But if it isn't in your own backyard, it doesn't make the newspapers. This century is particularly interesting because it follows on the end of a long period from about 1550 to the first part of the present century. <clears throat> follows on a period that was cold and is known to scholars of past climates as the Little Ice Age. 
About 1550 to 1650, the earth cooled off about as much as it warmed up in the last century. That little ice age was a time of, if we look at the record, increased volcanic activity, which more or less stopped in the middle of this century. When we look at the details of the last century alone, we see that there's variations on the scale of one year to 10 years, and a sort of overall trend of warming from the beginning of the century to about 1950, and then irregular cooling into the 60s. And if you want to add on the most recent data, you find that it was a little warmer in the last few years, globally speaking. It's a little hard to tell what the truth is when you talk about globally speaking because if you gather up all of the various and sundry opinions on what the data actually looks like, you find that no, no two of them look alike. One of them that has been widely touted as being the, my data about global climate before a congressional committee turns out to be only the continents and not the oceans. And the oceans happen to be 70% of the world. If you add on the oceanic record, you get a still different thing. There's all fluctuations on there. These fluctuations within the last century or so on the scale of a few years can be matched up very neatly with variations in the transparency of the atmosphere, measured, not calculated at all. Direct measurements have been made of how transparent the atmosphere is. So widely used that we had to go back to the originals to dig out the data. It's been measured and recorded and measured and recorded for a century and nobody summarized at all. So we went back and dug out the original and summarized it. And that took a couple years, but at least we know now the facts about how transparent the atmosphere has been. And when we look at the variations in the last century, we find that the warming up of the Earth to the middle of the century was a time when the air was getting more transparent. And the cooling off was when the atmosphere was getting less transparent. Now, uh, if you took physical geography or beginning meteorology in college, probably the first thing they said is, well, the climate is driven by the sun. The sun provides the heat that warms the earth and so on, and probably that's the last time they mentioned it. But that is a fact. It is the sun that keeps the earth warm. And so if the amount of sunlight reaching the earth changes, the climate's going to change. Fortunately, the earth operates on the basis of pretty simple physics. If you turn up the heat, the earth gets warmer. If you turn down the heat, the earth gets colder. If the atmosphere is transparent, more heat gets through to the earth and it gets warmer. If you make the atmosphere less transparent, less heat gets through and the earth gets cooler. Okay, simple. And that's what we observe. The transparency did vary that way. And that transparency matches the volcanic record, which affects the transparency dramatically. And it's about the only thing that does on a global scale. But when we look at the temperature of the Earth over the last century, or we look at the transparency of the atmosphere over the last century, in other words, what we're really interested in is what happens to the climate. When we look at those, it doesn't even vaguely look like the record of carbon dioxide increase over the last century. What drives the climate primarily on the scale of decades to centuries to millennia? Variations in solar radiation incoming and what we have found is that when we model the atmosphere with models that include such things as air pollution, we find that we can more or less 
come up with a simulation of the last million years on the basis only of radiation calculated with details driven by variations in transparency of the atmosphere that have their origin in volcanic activity. What about carbon dioxide? Doesn't it have any effect? Yes, it has an effect. It is one of many gases that are important in the heat range, the infrared radiation range. What's the most important one? Well, the most important one happens to be the most important one happens to be water vapor. Uh, I've seen many, many papers written about greenhouse warming, and they say the important gases are carbon dioxide, chlorofluorocarbons, methane, and a few others. Wrong. The most important is water vapor. The only place that any of the other gases makes a difference is in that little bitty region in the infrared where water vapor is not opaque. That region gets clouded up by carbon dioxide, keeps heat from radiating out from the earth, gets clouded up by aerosols like air pollution, like dust in the air, and so on. So the important gases are first water vapor, then the mixture of carbon dioxide, aerosols, and the other things in that small region. In other words, that little range that water vapor doesn't soak up all of the heat radiation and then re-radiate it out to space, that little range is called the water vapor window. And sometimes that window is dirty, and that reduces the effect of everything else. by direct measurement. In fact, back in 1899, they measured the effect directly in space and by from the Earth, but directly measuring the infrared radiation from the Earth and the effect of carbon dioxide on it. And now they use laboratory measurements. But back in 1899, they did it the direct way and got better answers. How about the future? What's going to happen next? Well, we already took care of the next ice age. There's going to be one. How about the variations in the next century? Well, we hear a lot about the fact that the carbon dioxide is increased, and there's no arguing about it. The measured values so that the carbon dioxide's increased. What do we see that's happened in the past when carbon dioxide increases? Well, one of the things we see when we look at the past and see what carbon dioxide has done is 10,000 years ago. I mentioned the fact that the Earth warmed up very rapidly about 10,800 years ago. About 10,000 years ago, give or take a few centuries, the amount of carbon dioxide almost doubled. Now, obviously, that was not due to industry, right? or even slice and burn agriculture. The temperature went up first, then the carbon dioxide nearly doubled, and then what happened? To read a lot of the public, the popular literature these days, you'd think, well, of course, the Earth would have to then warm up dramatically, about three to five degrees Celsius after that doubling or near doubling of the carbon dioxide. Guess what happened? Nothing. Nothing. We know. Field observations. You don't have to wave your hands. You can go out and do the field studies and find out that nothing happened. I showed you or told you about some investigations where we could simulate what has happened on the century scale, on the multi-century scale. In doing that, we assume that carbon dioxide 
was a consequence of warming. Because if you warm the earth up, you get carbon dioxide out of the ocean. If you cool the earth off, more carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean. So the carbon dioxide depends on the temperature rather than the temperature depending on the carbon dioxide. That's the assumption that was made, and the answers come out fine. Well, then what's all this business about, ooh, ah, the earth is going to burn up, you know? Global warming is upon us, and look out, carbon dioxide is increasing. Well, the field data doesn't show anything like that. The field data doesn't, sh the actual observations made out in nature don't show you any strong relationship to the increase of carbon dioxide. The only place you find any big effect of carbon dioxide on global temperature is in big complex computer models. Now these big models say, according to the popular articles about it, they say the big computer models show that with doubling of the carbon dioxide, the temperature will go up anywhere from 2 to 8 degrees centigrade, Celsius, whatever you want to call it, in the next century. That's not actually what the models show. The models show that if you simulate the present and simulate 50 years from now with double the amount of carbon dioxide, the difference between the two simulations is three to eight degrees. That's quite different than saying that the Earth will be warmer. It simply says that the model shows warmer than the simulation of the present. Then you have to say, well, how good is the simulation of the present? Some of the best computer modeling in the country was done right here in Oregon, Oregon State, Larry Gates and Mike Schlesinger and those guys, their models are as good as anybody's. But unlike most, they are honest enough to publish the accuracy of their models. Well, let's consider the accuracy of these models. When you look at the accuracy of big models, and they're all very similar. They're all very similar. <clears throat> when you look at the accuracy of the big computer models, you find that over the oceans, they're pretty good. The errors are not very big at all. Well, very good reason why the errors aren't very big. They put in the temperature of the ocean as a given to begin with. So it's surprising that there's an error other than zero. For Antarctica, they're routinely as much as 20 degrees off. All seasons. For the Arctic, 5 to 10 degrees off. For the continental interiors, eh, 5 degrees, 10 degrees off. Well, if the error is anywhere from in the continent, continental errors from 5 to 20 degrees, uh, what do you mean, fellas, when you're telling me that the world is going to warm up by 3 degrees? Your model isn't good enough to tell me that it's going to be three degrees. It could be plus or minus six or something like that. In other words, it might actually cool, right? Rather than warming. Well, how about <clears throat> the more critical thing of rainfall? How accurate are these models on predicting rainfall? Because we're a lot more controlled by rainfall than we are by temperature in the world in terms of feeding ourselves. Well, the published versions, you know, you can't blame the, the uh, modelers who publish these things for not making themselves look any worse than they have to. So they put down things like, well, the error in the oceanic areas is three, and the error in the monsoon region of India is 12 or 15, and the error somewhere else is minus three or minus five or minus 10. Minus three what? Millimeters per day. Well, if you want to know about annual rainfall, you have to multiply it by 365. Now, that doesn't look so good, does it? It means the error is over the whole map on the order of plus or minus 
100%. Now, if the error of the model is 100%, then what's the sense of talking about a potential 20% deficit of precipitation 50 years from now? The model doesn't show you that at all. It shows you 20% plus or minus 100%. Now, the models are actually great, but not for the purpose of making forecasts. When somebody says, our model shows you that in 50 years the Earth will be 8 degrees warmer, that is a forecast. How many successful 50-year forecasts have they made? Zero. How many successful 10-year forecasts? Zero. How many successful five-year forecasts? Zero. Five months? Zero. Five days? Slightly better than flipping a coin. Don't tell me about 50 years from now on a basis of forecasts like that. I have lots of experience with making forecasts, long range and short. And if there's anything I've learned as a forecaster is be sure you can actually make a forecast by testing your model before you stick your neck out. The one time I didn't really do that is when I told the general that if they went over to, another fellow and I, if, we, if they went over Japan the following day, they'd hit winds of 168 knots. And the general told me in un no uncertain terms what I was full of. But he came back <coughs> and said, yeah, we, uh, found 170, 170 knots, best forecast ever made. And it was an untested model, but they decided to call it the jet stream. There are lots of facts available. What do we do as a consequence of knowing what these facts are in the light of a lot of people saying, ooh, ah, uh, look out. One. There are perfectly valid reasons. There are perfectly valid reasons for conserving carbon-based fuels. First, they keep beautifully. I mean, one, they're in the ground and they just don't spoil at all. They've been there 20 million years and just as good as they ever were. They'll keep and we're going to need them because we do not have an infinite supply. So the perfectly valid reasons for saving. There are perfectly valid reasons for saving tropical rainforests. Incidentally, if you look at the addition of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, not on a per nation basis, because a nation that's bigger than another one puts out more than a smaller nation, obviously. But if you look at it on a per capita basis, who's the worst offender in terms of putting greenhouse gases into the air? Cambodia. In fact, most of the worst offenders are third world nations. And this is slash and burn agriculture and things like that that do it. If they had as much population as we have, they would be the world's leader in, in putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So there's perfectly valid reasons for saving tropical rainforests. There's perfectly valid reasons for developing the agriculture of these places so that they don't have to use slash and burn, which is very inefficient. There's perfectly valid reasons for doing all those things. But the, so we ought to do them. But there are two other things we ought to do. One do better science, make some models that have more reality about them, in other words, that have aerosols in them, that treat something other than just pure gas, make them recognize that the Earth is not spherical, it's actually flattened, and that puts systematic errors into models. But the other thing that we ought to do is in light of all the prescriptions for what to do about global warming is get a second opinion.
Jim Harris has the privilege of the first question. Jim? Dr. Bryson. First of all, I, I guess I'll ask a two-part question, but it's really not two parts. So what's the weather going to be like for Saturday and Sunday? <laughs> and that's a joke. We're serious. You suggest that we get a second opinion. Where do you suggest we get a second opinion that we can trust and have reliable uh, uh, credibility? You're doing it right here. I'm giving you a second opinion. It isn't easy because most of the people that have been working in carbon dioxide warming kinds of studies have all been supported by the same agency. And if they didn't agree, they wouldn't get the support. There are out there, though, a lot of perfectly good scholars who have not been supported by the Department of Energy originally, in all of the, which used to be called the Atomic Energy Commission. There's lots of scholars out there, and I could, I could name half a dozen of them, who do not have the psychological or economic research commitment to an idea which may or may not be true. There's a lot of them out there, and you are doing one of those second opinion kinds of things by asking me to be here and say, what do I, as a knowledgeable scholar in the field of climate, think about this other opinion. I have the advantage, of course, of many of my colleagues in that my research has been sponsored over the last 15 years or so by a, an individual patron so that I'm not beholden to any viewpoint. And that's a lovely thing. I think there ought to be more of that so that we can get honest second opinions but there are plenty out there, and all you have to do is go around and find them and compare those who have data with those who don't have data, those who have field evidence with those who are hand-waving. You've got to remember that the theoretician knows no fact. He knows but theory, thus does not know that he is dreary. <laughs> the outside world is big and wide, but learn from it is neath his pride. An ostrich, when he's so disposed, leaves his backside most exposed. <laughs> Our second question will come from Dana Peck, chair of the Standing Committee on Science and High Tech. Dana? Dr. Bryson, thank you for a delightful afternoon. Uh, as we see the media give attention to the modelers to a greater and greater extent. Are there things that we should specifically look for in those modelers to see if they are, in fact, improving their work? Are there, are there folks that, that we can look to with greater credibility than others, since it seems to be a community that's kind of surfaced and is still getting attention? Well, too much of the debate has gone on in the highly abbreviated form of newspaper reports and accounts of that kind, uh, Forbes magazine, Barron's, so on. Knowledgeable professionals, that's yourself. You know, you know enough to understand a sound argument. And I think there ought to be more unheated but open, clear discussion with a balanced group. If you look at meetings that have been held on the carbon dioxide issue, all of the invitees are on one side of the issue or the other. So it's the, you know, they're preaching to the already converted. But a mix of the two in a low key kind of thing and insist that it be in plain English because I have found in my now rather long career in science 
that if you can't say it in plain English, you probably don't understand it yourself. And if you say it in plain English, unfortunately, then everybody will understand it. And if, they, if it turns out to be that simple, then why should they pay you so much? <laughs> so, you know, there's reasons for having all this jargon, but if you insist, you can get the jargon cut down to where everybody can understand it. Then the fallacies will stand out like the proverbial sore thumb. I'm uh, Paul Milius, and I'm a City Club member. And uh, I will admit that I found this question on the table. So somebody must, and it was all taped on the card, so somebody must want to answer, ask very seriously. So here it goes. You have expressed skepticism about the scientific basis for concluding that global warming is upon us. But if global warming is even a remote possibility, shouldn't we be taking some steps now just in case? If so, what should those be? Well, that is probably the most standard statement of the of the half decade. If there's even a remote chance, we better do something. At the expense of what? Some of you in here are financial experts, and so you know what foregone opportunities cost. If we want to do something about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we have to do it on a global basis, which means we have to get the Russians and the Chinese and the Indians because it is a matter of per capita production of stuff. If we take and say to the Russians, how about cutting down? Oh, no. They told me themselves, we don't want to cut down because we want carbon dioxide warming. It's too cold in Russia. <laughs> the Chinese aren't going to do anything about it because they can't afford to. Their only big source of fuel is coal. They don't have the capital to go to something else, and they need the oil for foreign exchange, what oil they do produce. India isn't going to do anything about it because they have nothing but coal, and they say, it's our turn to produce, to pollute, rather. It's our turn to pollute. But then, since when did we ever get a logical answer for them? And I've been there 21 times trying to. So the problem is that if you could do anything significant other than cutting yourself off unilaterally, destroying what little we have left of an economy, which wouldn't do much good because the others would simply say, well, there's more for us now, and they'd proceed to do it. Even if you could do it, the cost is so enormous that you would have to do it at the expense of other things foregone, such as feeding the hungry, housing the homeless. And I'd rather take my chances on some climatic variation, which in past centuries man has somehow managed to respond to, especially since my own calculations suggest that we might in 50 years get back to about what we were in 1950 AD. Well, we got through that all right. We could probably get through it again. So it's the foregone gone opportunities that say, oh no, you don't take that attitude of if there's even the remotest chance because we know that people are hungry and we know that people are not housed and we know that there are other problems and we only have a suspicion that maybe there's going to be some amount of warming and maybe not. Vivian Solomon, City Club member. I understand that you recently returned from a trip to Hungary. Uh, we've heard a lot about the environmental problems in the Eastern Bloc and I'd wonder, I'm wondering if you could tell us how bad was it and what, if anything, we should be doing about it. Was and is bad in terms of problems in Hungary. The Hungarians are madder than all get out at the fact that their former top dogs made it so that it didn't matter whether a factory polluted or not, as long as it turned out the goods that the party needed. And they, for efficiency, they put the workers right next to them. 
So here are these heavily polluting industries with the workers living there, which meant that they got a 24-hour-a-day pollution load, and their statistics show that their young men, 18 to 40-year-old men, are dying at twice the rate that they would be expected to. It's killing their young men, and they are better than hell. It's bad. Good morning, Chad, City Club member. Uh, it seems as though we need energy pretty well, and uh, we've sort of got a choice of coal, which is, as you point out, very polluting and puts out a lot of sulfur, which you mentioned wasn't so good. The alternative is clearly nuclear power, and here in Oregon we're talking about shutting down Trojan. Had you know if there are any credible numbers which figure out how many lives are lost per megawatt hour generated or whatever uh, by the mining, transporting, and burning of the various fuels that are available to us and the aftermath thereof, including up to Chernobyl? You know, that's an interesting question. I, the, the answer is straightforward. I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know the answer to a related question. We wouldn't have to put out the amount of pollution if there were fewer of us. We wouldn't use so much coal if there were fewer of us. We wouldn't need so many nuclear plants if there were fewer of us. We wouldn't use so much pesticide on the crops if there were fewer of us. If we get down to what is the basic environmental problem, the basic environmental problem is too many people. Dr. Bryson, you tossed out what I took to be a hint uh, that intrigued me, and I'd like to ask you if this was intended. You had mentioned uh, earlier that the principal source of funding for the uh, people who seem to be uh, touting the greenhouse effect is the uh, United States Department of Energy, formerly known as the Atomic Energy Commission. May one reasonably infer from that that uh, assuming there is some sort of a, uh, an inclination to, to want to tell your boss what he wants to hear, that those who favor nuclear energy as a, uh, an alternative to fossil fuel may be behind a lot of the greenhouse effect alarm? <laughs> you caught the hint. I can't prove anything about it. I can state, honestly, that a Swiss industrial representative told me that they were supporting research in carbon dioxide in order to show that carbon dioxide and coal burning stuff was bad and therefore they could sell more turbines for nuclear power plants. So I can attest that in one case industrial support was for the purpose of furthering nuclear energy. Whether it's true in the United States or not, I can't prove, but I can say that I have been to meetings on this topic where they started out by saying, we will not tolerate any discussion in this meeting of whether carbon dioxide will make the earth warmer. We are only going to allow discussion of the consequences thereof and the peripheral details of the question. And at no time did they allow a discussion of whether the basic premise was correct or not. And those of you who have read a lot of scientific papers know that the derivations in the scientific paper are hardly ever wrong. The place where the errors occur is in the fundamental assumptions that are made, not always explicitly. City Club member, Dr. Uh, Returning to the theme of who to believe in these matters that involve uh, difficult policy and scientific questions and at the frontiers of scientific knowledge, am I understanding you to say that any credible scientist with credentials similar to yours who would look at the same data that you've looked at and the field observations you made reference to could reach only one conclusion, and that conclusion would be that carbon dioxide plays no significant role in contributing to global warming? No, they've, you've overstated it a little bit. It may play some role, but not the only role. 
See, the discussion has been largely, and, and a lot of this could come right out of a simple recognition that carbon dioxide is not the only factor involved in the atmosphere. In fact, it is a relatively minor one. But in the discussions of what will happen in the next 50 years, it's based on the assumption that carbon dioxide is the only factor that produces climatic change. Put it very simply, suppose we assume that they're absolutely 100% right, that doubling the carbon dioxide would warm up the Earth 3 degrees centigrade. Suppose that's absolutely correct. But stating explicitly what is implicit in that statement, ceteris paribus, all other things being equal. But unfortunately, the ceteri aren't always paribus. <laughs> what if volcanic activity rises to its usual long-term intensity? <clears throat> We know that that's enough to completely override the effect of the carbon dioxide. So that gives us at least 100% uncertainty. Because if we don't also know what's going to happen to the volcanoes, we can't say what the total effect will be, and that's what counts to us. <clears throat> Did that answer the question? Sort of. If I might, Jen, just clarify, is would you, as a scientist, advise the President of the United States that he or she uh, in the future could safely rule out uh, carbon dioxide and the other greenhouse gases as a element to be controlled, uh, that the other natural forces uh, are so dramatic that they would swamp any um, effect from these man-caused gases, and therefore we could prudently, for the benefit of future generations, let's say, rule them out and, and, and say that that's just not an area where uh, investments in control technologies for global warming reasons uh, would be a prudent thing to do. Well, believe it or not, I'm not quite that bold as to say rule it out. I'd say, again, get a second opinion. Because it's like anything else where you say, black or white, rule it out. Well, after enough years of grading papers, you know that the truth is somewhere in between. That if you want to give the students a clue on what to mark wrong, you say, all or none. You really catch them and make them think if you say, most or almost none. But it's a dead out giveaway that it's, it's a wrong answer if you say all or none. So I would say get a second opinion. Think carefully about it before you go off half cocked with our tax dollars to the tune of umpteen trillion. David Porter, City Club member. Um, you said that transparency in the short term cycles is a major factor in heating and cooling. And I wonder. Is the transparency is, is largely, from what I hear you saying, a product of particles in the atmosphere of various kinds? Aerosols. Okay. Actually, the most important one is sulfuric acid droplets in the stratosphere. Okay. Well, the question I had was, are the kinds of human activities such as industrial production, power generation, burning forests, producing other things, aerosols or particulate matter, at a level that that will have an impact? Or are those minute <coughs> enough that they should be ignored? There's a lot of th things where the natural production and the human production are rather similar. For example, half the sulfur, sulfuric, sulfur dioxide that goes into the air each year is from industry, from human activities, and the other half is from nature. So you can, you can never control more than half of it because half is natural. Even on things like chlorine, there's a station in Antarctica that measures chlorine in the atmosphere because they want to detect 
stuff coming from the northern hemisphere that might change the ozone and make a hole in the ozone over Antarctica. So here's a station that measures chlorine. Upwind from it is Mount Erebus. Mount Erebus started erupting just before the amount of chlorine at that station went up, and the volcanologists calculate that the output of chlorine from Mount Erebus is 1,000 tons per day, which is equal to the total global use of chlorine in making chlorofluorocarbons. So again, one volcano is equal to all of human activity, uh, which is controllable, all the human activity is, which is not anybody that can cap a volcano is going to make himself rich. Remember, do I understand that if uh, George Bush asked you for your views on global warming, that you might tell him the most important step he could take would be to initiate programs in world family planning? <laughs> <coughs> well, that's a longer term thing, and I don't think he would have any impact upon India, for example, or Africa by doing it in the first place because we can't afford to do it for the whole world. But uh, that is what has gotten us to the point where we're really doing some problems. No, I wouldn't say do that because the time scale is wrong. If you really want to do something about potential of greenhouse effect, it would be to get a nice, rational, careful, thoughtful look at whether it's really something to get all head up about in the first place. Because then maybe we could put our attention on more important things. Like family planning. I'm Herb Crane, a member. Uh, I'm fascinated by your presentation and I love it. But you made one comment that no one has referred to and I'm driven to ask. Who then is your sponsor? A private individual. No industry at all? No, no industry at all. Thank you. And the individual wish to be anonymous and to have nothing to say about what I did with the money, just that thought that I had a good approach to things and ought to be supported without having any quid pro quo with anyone else. And I think that's a good attitude and I think that you people are in a position to influence others to support independent views as that person did. Thank you very much. Are we out of time? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bryson. We are adjourned.